since I don't have any tattoos or holes in my body, or I don't wear skinny jeans, uh, allow me just a moment to be old, a little bit sentimental, and reflect on this place. It's so fitting that today you had an opportunity to celebrate 60 years of the history of this conference. Uh, that history is woven deeply into the fabric of the institution, the air that you breathe, what you sense when you walk on this campus. And certainly our personal history, my wife and my personal history, my wife's and my personal history, is also woven into the fabric of this institution. And the institution is woven into the fabric of our lives. Um, if you have an opportunity throughout the rest of this week, I know we're coming to the end, uh, let me encourage you to take some time and have a conversation with Walt Baker, who's been a part of the community of Denver, of <laughs> I'm in Dallas this week, the community of Dallas Seminary uh, for a long, long time. Uh, my wife and I met here. We met in Howard Hendricks' office, and so we have um, wonderful memories of Prof and Gene uh, building into our lives early of the importance of ministry flowing from a marriage. Uh, when we came back here, we came back into a community uh, with that many, with many people who had taught us and grounded us in the Scripture. I told you a bit of my story. I came to faith in a real understanding of faith later in my life, later meaning in, as a freshman in college, not as a child. And I had no grounding. When I came here, I was completely clueless. I, didn't, I came here because I heard Howard Hendricks speak at a Campus Crusade conference and thought, man, if he can do that, that's where I want to go. So I got here, and I remember I was on campus, and somebody said the word exegesis. And I'm thinking, hmm, is that like somebody who used to be Jesus? What? <laughs> I, I had no clue. I, I was sitting in my first Bible class, and uh, these two guys got in an argument over the date of Zerubbabel's return. And the coolest thing about that was when I went to college, there was this really good cover band that played in all the bars around campus called Zerubbabel. And I'm thinking, <laughs> wow, did they make an album I didn't know about? I knew nothing when I came here. And this place grounded me, gave me a, a, a desire and a love to have some sense of fabric to my faith, some sense of of substance in my enthusiasm for loving and living as a Christian. I pray that you will allow the history and the fabric and the ethos of this place to deeply, deeply penetrate your defenses and that you will learn and that you will change because of the men and women who are creating this place. Uh, this is a great privilege for you to be a part of this community. And so, friends, those of you that I worked with and, and studied under, I love you. I'm so thankful for the privilege God gave me to be a part of this community. Okay, so now let's stop being sentimental and move on to better things. We've been talking about this whole idea of the abundant life. And we've been asking the question, is this life that Jesus said that He would give, this life uh, that is abundant or this life that is full, life in the full, is this the life of mission? On Tuesday, we talked about what I called the gospel of abundance, the, this good news of God, the announcement that through the death and the resurrection of Messiah, of Christ, there is now life full and abundant in Him. Uh, this gospel announces that the Messiah has now defeated evil and sin and death and now brings God's shalom, the fullness of life as it was created to be lived spiritually and personally and relationally and socially. We went on to say that this abundant life is kingdom life. It's the life that comes to us as we are invited to participate in the purpose and mission of God, as we are commissioned to participate in God's role, rule over all creation. 
The way I'd like for you to remember it is we are given the privilege now to live life to the fullness. We are given the privilege to announce life in a world that is blinded and deceived. And we are given the commission to bring life full and abundant. This abundant life is the way of mission. It's the God-ordained means, God-ordained means whereby His people live out His reign over the earth. This is not just a gospel of personal benefit. I want to step back just for a moment and talk about this whole issue of believing in Jesus as King. We have a significant cultural problem when it comes to understanding and relating to the figure of Jesus, the person of Jesus as a king who rules over evil, sin, and death. Culturally, if, you're not, if I'm not mistaken, our whole country got started because we didn't like having kings. And so as a result, this idea of somehow relating to someone with absolute sovereignty who absolutely rules, who has the power of life and death in their hand. This idea that somehow there is someone in whose presence we are so unworthy that to be invited into His presence in and of itself is a privilege. This truth that we are invited by this King to be associated with Him and being invited by this King to be associated with Him is the greatest honor in life is something that you and I just don't get. Let's be honest. When we come into relationship with authority and power, we think we can vote Him out of office or at least get on the radio and rant about it for a little while. But the reality is when we say that we believe in Jesus Christ, when Paul says that Christ died for our sins, he's talking about this promised one who would initiate the rule of God, this king who would come and reign over all creation. This king in whose presence we should be terrified because he holds the very power of life and death in his hand. This is the one who says to us, like he said to Peter in Luke chapter 5, don't be afraid. To think that a king calls you and me friend is a staggering reality that only we are only glimpsing when we use the language of Messiah King. Yesterday we focused on the abundance of this King, and we asked whether our vision of Jesus is sufficient. We asked the question, is Jesus enough? And the answer, of course, is Jesus is enough. The issue isn't Jesus, the issue is us. As I said to my wife recently, I think I have a Jesus problem. What I've wanted to do more than anything else is to reduce, reduce Jesus to a manageable Jesus, to someone who only seeks my good, to someone who only heals me, who, someone who only hears me. I don't want to worship a Jesus who commands me and demands of me. But this is, in fact, the Jesus, the promised one in the picture of Scripture. We explored some of the implications of this abundance of life that comes to us because we're privileged to be associated with this King. The abundance of kingdom living directly contradicts some of the bedrock values of earthly kingdoms. When Jesus says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, he wasn't saying that his kingdom had nothing to do with this world. He's saying that his kingdom is unlike any earthly kingdom. Earthly kingdoms are established through power, coercive power and wealth. Heavenly kingdoms are established through weakness and death. And so when, in fact, we say that we want to live this abundant life, this way of mission, this way of the kingdom, we are fundamentally signing up for a way of life that will make us different than all the kingdoms around us. And so today and tomorrow, what I want to do is explore further what are the implications of this life of abundance that's found in the way of mission, in the way of the kingdom, this life that means that we have the privilege now to live life to its fullest, announce life to a dying world, and bring life 
as followers of the crucified and risen King Jesus. We're going to look at two characteristics of this abundant life. You can call this abundance redefined. The first we're going to look at today is homelessness. And the second, tomorrow, we're going to look at foolishness. You remember yesterday we looked at Luke chapter 9, and in that passage, this man says to Jesus, I want to follow you, teacher. And Jesus says to him, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. We just explored yesterday this idea that Jesus had no home as an itinerant ministry throughout the land of Galilee. No place could claim, his ab- claim him as their own, even though Nazareth tried to do that. Because he lived everywhere and nowhere at the same time, he was all of Israel's Messiah. The poor, the outcast, the lost, the least, these are the ones among whom Jesus spent his time. And as someone without a home, we recognize that those who do not have that home have no social identity, no social credibility. Homelessness homelessness is the last thing you and I would think of when we think about an abundant life. Isn't that true? I mean, can you imagine one of these million-dollar smiles on TV promising you a life of homelessness? Would you send them 1995 to get there? (laughs) Yet it is frequently true that when we are homeless, God works in ways that we couldn't possibly imagine. This idea of homelessness perhaps has its roots in a story in the Old Testament found in Genesis chapter 12. And so if you have your New Testaments, turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. Did I just do something funny? What did I do? At Denver, Genesis in the New Testament. (laughs) You guys are way behind. I don't know about... Genesis chapter 12. Don't you tell our friend Danny Carroll I said that. In Genesis chapter 12, we meet this figure in the the old (laughs) days. I can say it again. We meet this figure by the name of Abram. And when we meet Abram, we find that he's, uh, he's the son of a man called Terah. He lives in the land of Mesopotamia. And according to Joshua chapter 24, verses 2 and 3, Terah worshipped false gods. What are the chances that Abraham didn't worship the gods of his father Terah? Pretty slim. And so this Abram, this worshiper of false gods, and if we perhaps look into the history, perhaps a worshiper of Astronomical, de- uh, 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 be astronomical entities, maybe moon worshiper, who knows? God somehow reveals Himself to him. We don't know how. For whatever reason, the, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this little detail isn't given to us. But in some way, God makes Himself known to this Abram. And in verse 1 of chapter 12, we read, what this one true God says to this moon worshiper. Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. The Lord's call to Abram involved separation from the very foundations of his life. His call to leave his land is a call to leave prosperity. His his call to leave his family is a call to leave security. His call to leave his father's house is a call to leave his identity. One commentator has written it this way, in short, the call was to abandon all natural connections, to surrender all social customs and traditions, to leave land, clan, and family. These were the very areas of strong attachment which in the ancient world would have been thought to provide ultimate personal security. Whatever binds him to the past is to be discarded in this call, which now comes to him to be the father of a new nation. Essentially, what God is calling Abram to is homelessness. 
God's call to Abram is so indistinct that it's almost unthinkable that anyone would respond to it. His call is to leave. One translator writes it this way, get up yourself and go to an undefined place. If God were to say, get up and go to paradise, perhaps we'd be willing to leave behind all of our hopes of prosperity and all of our hopes of security and all of our hopes of identity and want to go someplace better, but God doesn't even tell him yet where he's going to go. It's just get up yourself and go to homelessness. In the midst of this promise, in the midst of this command, God then gives Abram a promise. He says to him, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great. But notice, there is no mention at this point of a place, just that God will do it. Surely you could argue that the fact that He promises to make him a great goy a great nation implies perhaps a landed place. The idea of blessing him implies that he will have prosperity, and a great name means that his prosperity and his place wherever he's going to be will cause people to honor him and to look at him with respect, something more valuable than all the camels and all the wives and all the slaves that could be gathered in the ancient Near East. But God, in this command to Abram to become homeless, to leave all that he knows, promises that there will be even someone who is blessed beyond Abram himself, because as the promise unfolds, it crescendos into the great purpose of this promise, so that at the end of verse 3, all peoples will be blessed in you. And so the very purpose of God for all of human history, that all peoples will be blessed in the God of Abram, and the very mission of God whereby He establishes that His purpose will be accomplished by His people is given in the context of a command to Abram to become homeless. Fascinating. If I were Abram, I'd say, you know, I could do it from here, God. Why don't you just lay it on me right now? Make me a great blessing here. Make me a great nation here in Mesopotamia. Bless me. Make my name great. Then we'll let all the nations come, and we'll just have a big old party, just like you designed it. But let's do it here. Because, I, you know, here I know it's going to work. I mean, I can see it happening here. Because we already have some wealth, we got some land, we got all, all that you need to start, God. We got the best location in town, a good marketing plan, and a great band. We got all that we need to start, God. Let's just do it here. No, God says, get up or get yourself up and go. And Abraham did it, or Abram did it, just as the Lord commanded. He left everything and became, in Genesis 14, 13, someone that he describes as a landless wanderer, a word translated Hebrew in English, a viru, someone without social presence, someone who lives in someone else's home or on someone else's land. And so he wanders through this land, and as he wanders through the land, in verse 7 of chapter 12, in verse 8 of chapter 12, in verse 18 of chapter 13, he builds altars to Yahweh, establishing that he's in this land and he's worshiping a God who isn't necessarily the God of this land at this time, and establishing that the worship of God in this land is what is the one who ought to be worshiped. And as he wanders through other people's land, as he lives in other people's places and drinks other people's water and grazes on other people's pastures, God gives him wealth and numbers to the point that even the kings in that region begin to fear him. In Abraham's abandonment of his own homeland, his willingness to leave everything and become a homeless wanderer God establishes for Himself a people who are first to be identified by their allegiance to the God who has called them, 
During this period of time, they are, be to, they are to be known as those who build altars to Yahweh, not as those who possess this land or that land or have this way of life, but those who worship this God. And so at the very beginning of the establishment of the people of God, the core identity of the people of God is made known. That is the confession of the one true God. And as they live out this confession to the one true God, as they, they live life the way this one true God has designed it to be lived in Torah, as they announce that there's life in this God to the nations around them, even as they are homeless in the wilderness, as they bring life to those who come and worship, as in Psalm 87 and 1 Kings chapter 8, they are living the abundant life that is found only in God. Think about it. God gives them a law so that they can live in ways that reveal His character. God goes before them throughout the wilderness and establishes that He is the one true God, more powerful than all other gods. And God then brings to them the nations. And as they come, these nations, and they worship, God hears their prayers. And He says in Psalm 87, it's as if they were born in me. This is the abundant life. And it all starts because Abram is willing to be homeless. This idea of homelessness then comes into the New Testament as well. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2 in our Old Testaments. 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter begins describing to those who have confessed faith in Christ who they are, using the language of Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. He says to them, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. If we were to go back into Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, we would see this language, particularly in the Septuagint, used very clearly. It's the idea that God has established them. They aren't a people because of their own might, because of their own wealth, because of anything they possess. They're a people because God has established them. And as God has established them, He has made them, them, he has made them a royal priesthood, those who stand between God and the nations, who mediate the requirements of God to the nations and mediate the worship of the nations back to God. He's made them a holy nation, those who live distinctly and differently from all of the other nations and communicate what it means to be in fellowship with God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 for that reality. And then they are called God's special possession, God's treasure, as it's described here. This is the idea of a, of a king having a treasury, and in that treasury, there is treasure that he values more than all the rest that's in his treasury. It's perhaps a horse, or perhaps a wife, or perhaps a jewel that he values over everything that he possesses. That's who the people of God are. And then interestingly enough, Peter says to these people, you are all of these things so that, and if you don't have that transition in your phrase, that connection in your New Testaments, write it in the, in the margin, so that you may declare, you may make known, you may announce the excellencies of this God who has created you. And then he transitions in verse 10. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter likely is appealing here to Hosea chapter 2 verse 23 where the prophet, where the Lord says through the prophet, I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. And so once again, the core identity of the people of God is not the place where they dwell, the space that they occupy. It is in fact their confession of the one true God. 
You are my God. The primary point of identity for the believer is their God, their allegiance to the one true God, to the promised one, the crucified and risen King, the Lord Jesus Christ. We belong to Him first. Listen to me. We belong to Him first, not to a nation, not to a race, not to a socioeconomic class, not to a church, and not to a theology. We belong to Him first. Isn't it, isn't it instructive in the book of Acts that as the people of God work through this tension, the confessors of the risen one, the risen Jesus, the promised Messiah, as Gentiles and Jews work it out. What does it mean to be a community where those who confess Christ are known as that community across this age-old division known as Jews and Gentiles, that it's not until Acts chapter 11 where we read that Jews and Greeks come together in worship of King Jesus that the believers are known as what? Christians. You couldn't call them Jews because they were Greeks there, and you couldn't call them Greeks because they were Jews there. So what are you going to call them? Let's call them Christians. Our identity begins in Christ, and everything else that we are comes after that. And so Peter goes on, and he uses this fascinating phrase in verse 11. He says to them, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. What a fascinating phrase. Peter's already used this phrase in describing them in verse 1 of chapter 1 and verse 17 of chapter 1. Used the terms in this, in this book before. The full phrase is found in Genesis 23, chapter 4. Chapter 23, verse 4 in the Septuagint, where Abraham again describes himself to the Hittites as a foreigner and a visiting stranger. What does that mean? Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. Perhaps we would translate the phrase resident aliens and visiting foreigners in our translations today. Maybe the word expatriate comes to play. Maybe refugee maybe recently arrived immigrant. The idea is that this is someone who is not in their home. They're not in the place of their birth. They're living outside of the context in which they were born and in which they were nurtured. It doesn't just mean a tourist. It just doesn't just mean a visitor. It alludes to someone who is now living in a place other than their home, someone who from their cultural perspective is now homeless. And those of us who've lived in countries other than our, other than our own know exactly what this phrase means. Listen to me. The concept of homelessness in the Scriptures is not a concept of place. It is a concept of value. Those who are foreigners and exiles in another place are those who do not participate fully in the customs and practices of the culture where they live. They do not have all the privileges and accesses, access to power of the citizens of that land. They are often misunderstood and blamed for anything that goes wrong in that land. They can be taken advantage of by those in power. They are easily cheated and deceived. They are watched closely. They are watched critically. And they are frequently watched suspiciously by those around them. This describes a dislocatedness. Where, where, where what we once were no longer works because we are homeless in the place where we live. This homelessness is the way of abundance because it strips us to the way that our culture has limited us and propped up our understanding of what it means to be a confessor of Christ. I want to use two metaphors with you. 
when we talk about our culture, our home culture. First is the culture that comes from, in my experience, working around farm animals, but also when we were living in Vienna, Austria. We lived in Vienna in the early 1980s, and if you were to go into the center of Vienna, you could pay an exorbitant amount of money to get a ride in a carriage drawn by beautiful horses. And because these horses were pulling these carriages through busy city streets, you would notice that these horses were wearing two pieces of leather on the sides of their head. You know, has anybody else here ever seen that? Say hello. Say yes. Okay. These are called blinders, right? Guess what blinders do? They blind you. They keep the horse looking where that which is coming from the side isn't going to distract them and spook them. Our culture is a set of blinders. Our culture only allows us to look within the scope of the assumptions and the values with which we were raised. Culture is essentially a limiting force. It keeps us from seeing what's beyond the frame within which we're looking. And so when we become homeless, when we're dislocated from our home culture, all of a sudden the blinders are pushed out. And we begin to see things that we never saw before. Ways of life, ways of thinking, ways of valuing, ways of worshiping the one true God. The second metaphor I want to use for you is the metaphor of training wheels. (laughs) If you have a young child, you're trying to teach them to ride a bike, or at least they're starting out riding a bike, what do they have on their bike? Training wheels. Training wheels are great. Because you can get on the bike and you can pretend that you know how to ride the bike. (laughs) Training wheels are great because you don't have to have the balance that's necessary to ride the bike. You don't have the strength that's necessary to ride the bike. The training wheels prop you up in your own deficiencies. And you don't know that you need the training wheels. You think you can ride a bike. Our culture props us up. It allows us to think that we are far more competent and far more godly and far more in tune with what God is about when in fact it's just our culture propping us up. For those of us who've lived outside our own contexts, we understand this whole question of how culture limits us and how culture props us up. When we move to another culture, we immediately have this sense of personal disorientation because we can no longer make life happen the way it's supposed to happen. Culture is essentially a map that tells you how to get to point, from point A to point B. And so when you get to another culture and you've got to get from point A to point B, which means you've got to get from your house where there is no milk to the store where there is milk and back to your house where there is no milk, you no longer, no longer know how to do that. Our culture creates pops that we are self-sufficient in and of ourselves, that we can make life happen, that we can make church happen, then we can make people come to faith because we know the way to do it. And all of a sudden, in our homelessness, we find that none of that works anymore, and it batters our egos. I'll never forget, we, uh, when we moved to Poland, <laughs> I love language learning. So I attacked Polish. I'm not a language learner that fills out grammar charts. <laughs> to learn a language, you've got to live it. You've got to speak it. You've got to smell the breath of people who are speaking it. <laughs> you've got to get close and hear it and see the expressions on their face. So I had learned two phrases of Polish, and I decided to go practice. The phrases were very simple. Hello, what's your name? So I went to the local school, the playground, to practice my two phrases of Polish. And I walked into the school ground, and I said to these children playing on this playground equipment, children who looked like they were old enough to interact with me, Hi, hello, dzień dobry, 
What's your name? Yakshana Zivam. And they looked at me. I'm thinking, well, okay, maybe that person doesn't know his name. So I went to the next one. <laughs> I asked the next child, Jindobre, Yakshana Zivam. I'm thinking, what is wrong with these children? Three or four times in the playground, Jindobre, Yakshana Zivan, same reaction. So I gave up. We went back to our house. We had a lady there, a Polish lady, who was helping us get established in Poland. And, and I'm frustrated. And I said to her, you know, I went to the playground and I was trying to ask these children what is their name. And I asked them what their name and they looked at me. And she said, well, tell me what you said. And I said, I said, Jindobre, Yakshana, Zivam. And she starts to laugh. She said, Mark, you just went up to those children and says, hello, what is my name? And so I have these images of these Polish children going home. Mom, mom, this big guy came to the playground. He didn't know his name. <laughs> when you're homeless, your ego takes a battering because you don't know how to make life happen. The movement away from one's own cultural moorings creates significant disorientation and significant insecurity. But listen to me, it is the only way that we can move toward the abundance of life found solely in Christ. It is the movement outward, away from the comforts of our cultural home into the vagaries of a world we do not know. It is a dangerous movement that requires loss it is the movement of the incarnation, willing sacrifice, crushing humiliation, and the ultimate satisfaction of living out the will of the Father. There are a couple of other disorientations I'd like to visit with you about. Buckle your seatbelts. If we want to be homeless, to experience and live out this abundant life that is ours in the mission of God, we must separate ourselves from the endemic nationalism that is so much a part of our Christian identity and faith. We must surrender this myth of American exceptionalism and the concomitant myth of American messianism. There is, in fact, in our movement, a strong thread of thought that somehow this is God's new chosen nation that is biblically and theologically unsupportable. So as we move and dislocate ourselves from a faith that is built and woven together with a false understanding of the presence and power of our nation in the world, we will begin to find Christ. We can have no partisan political place in this nation, in this country, or in any society. We are of Christ first, not any political philosophy. I'm going to try to offend the rest of you now. <laughs> there is another dislocation that we have to pursue. This dislocation I'm going to call a theological dislocation. Any of you play the game tetherball? Am I the only person old enough to remember tetherball? If you know tetherball, raise your hand. Thank you. Plus, I now know you're awake, which is pretty cool. <laughs> you know how tetherball works? You get this pole, right? And at the top of the pole is a rope attached to the top of the pole, and on the end of the, of the rope is a ball. 
So you get two people, right? And they hit the ball. One hits it one way. One hits it the other way. And so the goal is to get the ball wrapped around the pole. And so you hit it. It wraps around that way. And the other guy hits it. It goes back that way. And then it wraps around. It goes back. Perfect metaphor for theological discourse. For 400 years, we've been hitting the ball around the same poles, talking to ourselves. Now, I'm not a counselor, but I would assume if somebody talked themselves for 400 years, we would consider that a pathology. (laughs) We're asking the same questions again and again and again, and the goal of our theological discourse is to somehow say that brand X Christianity is better than brand A Christianity. And so our theological discourse is fundamentally Christians using Christian language, talking about things that only Christians care about. But the truth of the matter is that the fertile soil of theology, of theological development, is when the Christian community answers the questions of the unbelieving world. And that will disorient you. That will dislocate you. It's one thing to sit in a classroom and talk about the exclusivity of Christ. It's another thing to sit face to face with a very well educated and a very successful person of Hindu background and say to them that Jesus is the only way to God. As a friend of mine told me two days ago, when he says that to someone dear to him who comes from that perspective, that person thinks that he's either stupid or dangerous. It's one thing to talk about what it means to be released, to be set free in Christ. It's another thing to have someone who is oppressed by a demon lying at your feet, foaming at the mouth, and believe in the power of God. That will disorient you. And when you are disoriented, When you cry out to God because you don't know how to answer that pluralist and you don't know how to overcome the power of the evil one, then you will live the abundant life of Christ. That doesn't happen unless you leave. That doesn't happen unless you're willing to set aside what has made you comfortable, what has made you secure, and to ask the risen Christ to empower you to see Him afresh and to work through you in ways you never thought possible. Homelessness allows us to live this abundant life because it brings us into the touch with the only one who brings life to a dying world. And so Peter goes on. He says, as foreigners, as these strangers living in this place, you have two obligations. And so let's look at them together, starting in verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing good, doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits. The end of verse 11, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits. You see, we may, be, we may be homeless, but we're not spaceless. Even the homeless create their space. Have you ever been to it? Sometimes under a bridge, sometimes in an entryway. It's so fascinating to me how some folks in that arena become very territorial. They protect their space. They create life in that space. It wouldn't be anything like what you and I call a home, has none of the comforts of home. It's wild, it's dangerous, it's uncomfortable. So Peter says to us, as those who are no longer a part of your home, make yourself a presence. Make that presence one that abstains from what is the deepest desire of the human heart, and that is to pursue one's good over everyone else's good. 
Because when you pursue your own good, so-called sinful desires, these unbridled wants, this willingness to go get whatever you want at anyone else's expense, when you pursue that, you wage war against what it means to be a follower of Christ. You wage war against your very soul. On the other hand, in this presence, in this space that you are occupying, live lives that those around you will think are good lives. There are values that are a part of this culture within which you find yourself that are good values. Live in ways that mirror those values. But don't forget, because at the end of the day, there are values you will not adopt, and there are values of the kingdom that you must live. And when you live out those values, those who see you living out those values will accuse you of doing things that are stupid or dangerous, otherwise known as wrong. Keep living that way. Live that way when they tell you that you're a fool. Live that way when they tell you that you're a detriment to society. Live that way when, in fact, they hate you because of your confession of Christ. And Peter's promise is simply this. When God brings it all to an end, when God consummates His great plan and the true goodness and true evil in the world is revealed, they may glorify God. My dear brothers and sisters, this is not an easy, nor is it a task for the faint of heart. This is a courageous life, a life lived not because I'm competent to live it, a life that announces life not because I know everything that it means to announce that life, a life that's lived in the context of being misunderstood, a life that's lived in the context of in many ways not even being comfortable with what I'm doing, with myself because I'm stepping out and doing it by faith because I believe in the risen Christ. This is the way of homelessness. This is the way of mission. This is the abundance that is ours when we find our life in Him. Let's pray together. So we thank you, our Father, for these uh, moments to reflect on a difficult, difficult idea, truth. I don't want to be homeless again. Everything within me craves living in the comfort of my own competence and the comfort of my own identity as, a, as an American and in the comfort of my own theological system that I've grown to love. Everything argues for me to stay put. Forgive me because I crave my home more than I crave your Son. Thank you, our Father, for the wonderful privilege of knowing the King, of being named by the King, of representing the King, of bringing the life of the King. We love you. And we confess the Lord Jesus as the sole object of our affection. And we pray in His name. Amen.